So you'll see this little contraption here. That's because I'm allergic to air conditioning. No kidding. So I have this chair in case it makes me dizzy, so that's if all of a sudden I sit down, it's not for effect. I'll try and make it look as if it's a fair effect, but it's not for effect. Um, that's because I get affected by air conditioning, I can suddenly become dizzy. So if I fall down, it's not a problem, just have to get up try and keep going. But that thing should save me and anyone sitting up the front that I've, had, I've done this with before. So at QCon, everybody at the front got my jokes, everybody at the back didn't. And I, I thought it was me, but I think it was just the air quality. Okay. How did we get here? I think you've probably read the brief, so um, I might try really to get this working. Here we go. So um, it's taken me a long time to work out what it is I've been actually doing for the last 10 years, and so I finally worked out it's transformative resilience. Okay, that's what I specialize in, transformative resilience. Um, and I've been an agile coach and I've done all of that. So I actually offer some transformative resilience. Gosh, it's hard to say. Um, training, if anybody wants any, uh, remote. Um, I do consult and coach leadership and delivery leads. That's my space, especially leadership. Um, and I, what I've done is I accompany agile and lean methods with all the stuff that we absolutely hate. I'm that person, right? I live in a state of hell all of the time. Everyone else is hell. But that's, uh, I come in for that type of stuff. Um, it's not meditation, it's not yoga, it's literally taking concepts, theory from Eastern philosophy and translating it into practical mechanisms that you can use with your teams and with leaders and so on. Okay. So the big quandary we're in is that uh, we have traps, stalemates and infinity loops. Those are the things that I tend to get called in to help with. So the fact that I'm still at The Economist and Springer Nature, I, you know, I just see there's plenty of those there. Um, how did we get here and how do we get out of the common things that people ask me? Yeah. So Buddhist theory, the thing that's interesting to me is that it starts with life is suffering. Yeah? <laughs> Great. Um, and then the Buddhist monks and nuns who do it the most walk around peaceful, joyous, engaged, and kind. And I'm like, either they're taking drugs or they know something. Yeah? So I'm going to just go through these two ways that they have of looking at the world. So this is not their religious stuff. This is the stuff that they've picked up from observing the world. So, you know, before there was the... Um, most recent scientific discoveries, they had some observations that are pretty in line with science now. And those things are helpful to have as shortcuts and shorthand when you're in very stressful health scenarios and you're thinking, what can I do here? Right? So that's my specialty. So we have two sections to this. One is what happens, the difficulty of life and work, and then, of course, how we suffer. How we suffer it. Yeah? So what's a hell loop? Well, the key word is repetitive difficulty, right? So repetitive practical stuff like maintenance or workarounds that never, ever ends. Or repetitive emotional stuff, right? Aggression, extreme wanting, fear that just never, ever ends. So we're okay with short bursts of it, but in the long term, it starts to wear us down and then we start getting really, really freaked out. Right, so examples of loops of difficulty, that's the practical stuff, are things like products and projects constantly degrading, strategies keep dysfunctioning, and success that doesn't stick, right? Examples of the suffering, right, the emotional stuff. We have endless difficult interactions with the same people, yes. Constant emotional decision-making that just forgets about the data or overrides it, and continuous political scenarios. So that's, that's the stuff that affects. So you can have Agile, you can have Lean, you can have the best stuff put in place, but you're still going to suffer from this. So what the hell is it? And how do we do something about that? So let's go to the first section, which is difficulty. So a lot of people come to me and go, OK, I admit our company is pretty messed up, or this situation is pretty bad, and so on and so on, but why is it endless? Why is it endless, right? Why do products and projects degrade constantly, no matter what we do? Why do strategies dysfunction? Even if it's going well, something happens. Why is success temporary? Well, I'm going to be jumping straight in, because I've only got 20 minutes or so. It's entropy, folks. 
right? So entropy is science, and I'm not going to explain it because then we're going to be here all day, but you can ask Chris, because he's a scientist, and he'll tell you all about entropy if you want to argue with him. All I'm concerned about, and all the monks and the nuns were concerned about, is the effects of entropy. This means that everything in the universe is subject to degradation, dysfunction, and expiry. I call this the three inevitables. Right? That's going to happen. Yeah. Well, you know, thank you, Catherine. That's a big statement. Let's test that, please. Yeah? Surely it's not true. OK. Effects of entropy are over here. Does it happen to a person? Degradation, aging. Dysfunction, illness. Expiry, death. OK, fine. Teams, well, we were working on this really amazing thing, and then it kind of degraded into legacy software. All right, that happens. Dysfunction, you can have a fantastic team, and suddenly it's an ineffective group. Expiry, suddenly the team has just not any use anymore. We've moved on, or we've restructured. OK, so that applies. What about business relationships? So relationships are, does it degrade? Sure, if you don't catch up with all your business network, often that does degrade, right? That relationship does degrade. What about uh, dysfunction? Well, you can end up in some sort of destructive competition with your contacts, can't you? Right? Your business relationships of different, different domains or different divisions. Expiry, you don't need the business relationship anymore, you've moved on, you can see the pattern. What about products? Products degrade, you need bug fixes, etc. Products dysfunction, you can have system meltdowns. Products expire, they get superseded. So I think I proved my point there a little bit, but because we're all in skeptical mindsets, which is very valuable and I don't want to lose it, what isn't affected by degradation, dysfunction, expiry? Usually I ask a question, I'm not going to because I don't have time. Okay, but we can argue afterwards. So people usually say things like, mountains, and you're like, hang on a minute. <laughs> think scientifically here, or concrete. Mm, no, I don't think the concrete industry would agree with you. Law, uh, how many times do we rewrite, 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 and adapt? Accounting, and hierarchy. We think that's around forever. Uh. This is why, if projects, products, strategies, and success, no matter what you do, degrades, dysfunctions, and expires. Entropy, it's the nature of the business. It's the nature of the business. Everybody says, thank you very much, I'm leaving, I'm quit. Yeah? It's up to us to work with it. That's the key. So, of course, when I, when I do the training of this, people are going, well, oh, great, thank you very much. What I mean, I'm going to be in forever. What's the upside? Well, beware of apathy, because it's not a free ride, because apathy has this little sting in the tail. If you don't interface with entropy, like cleaning a house, for instance, that's degrading, you don't clean it regularly, you get consequences. You can't sit back, because if you take your foot off the accelerator, entropy will take over and create disorder, stagnation, and you'll have missed opportunity. Okay, so now we're in a trap, aren't we? See that little trap? Do you see the feeling of tension within? Where are we going to go from here? You see, apathy might feel easier in the short term, especially if you're privileged, but there's this consequence it can have, like regret, guilt, and missed opportunity. When you look back at times when you were like floating through your privilege, and you go, oh my God, there's all these things I could have done. Yeah? That does hit you, even if you get away with it to the end of your life. Right. Thank you, Catherine, for depressing us all. Um, but how do I ever get into the driver's seat? Are we destined to be reactive to entropy forever? Forever. Well, here's your first tool, folks. You ready? Very, very complicated. You can use this as a risk eliminator. Bing! If you know that everything is going to be subject to degradation, dysfunction, and expiry, you can then mitigate against it by when you have your nice strategy and your plan or your project or your product, you can ask yourself a simple question. How might this amazing thing be affected by degradation? How might it be affected by dysfunction? Are we prepared? How might it be affected by expiry? When might it expire? Are we prepared? Real simple. That's something you can have in a very tense conversation. In fact, I've had situations where a, a C 
XO turned to me and said, do you know everything? I said, no, I don't know everything. I just know how to break everything. And all I was doing was saying, and how might degradation affect that? How might dysfunction affect that? How might expiry affect that? Yep, to every idea he ever said. Be careful with that tool. Tension can rise, but there's more. I'm going to offer you even more. So the next thing that this can give you is a way of turning it into advantage. I put this photo up and realized I think that's fake, so, you know, here we go. We tried. A simple process is to activate your intellect and trigger your creative thinking. Right? Geez, says the agile lean industry, how do we do that? Well, do the opposite. It's a very simple technique. So here's tool number two. When entropy hits, it's degrading. You think, how can I transform this? That's really what you're doing when you clean a house. It's degrading and you transform it back to the way you like it. Yep, that's living with entropy. That's an ongoing argument with entropy or conversation as I like to think of it, yeah? Dysfunction, when things are dysfunctioning and there's nothing you can do about it, how can we innovate around it? Yep, and if things are expiring, let's do the, that's why it's in yellow, happy positive thinking, it could be a new beginning, yeah? Okay, so human beings became the dominant species on the planet because they activated their intellect, got a bit more than the other animals, yeah? And they trigger their creative thinking, so they've got a relationship with entropy as every body does, and they embrace entropy, transform, innovate, and create new beginnings from whatever disasters the world threw their way. You know? Horses degraded. They degrade, dysfunction, and they expire regularly. That's a nuisance, right? So we invented carts and cars and trains and planes because we've got intellect, intellect and creativity. So we're in a constant relationship with entropy, and it's a bit like being in an ocean. We're surfing it, we're swimming in it, yep. Some people build their houses right next to an ocean because they go, look at that expanse, I just love it, even if it's a storm. And yet, in the face of entropy, we stand there and go, oh, I don't like it. We run into the ocean, kick, 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 yeah? Punch, punch, punch. It's all about me, that ocean is against me. That's what we do. High entropy is what we have in tech. Lots of degradation, dysfunction, and expiry that kicked off in the 80s, yep, getting faster and faster, and we all got drawn to it like flies because we could get to transform, innovate, and have new beginnings. You see, one person sees chaos and confusion from entropy, and another person looks at it and says, opportunity and new pathways forward. Thank you to people like Steve Jobs. Can't wait for the products to degrade so that I can make a new one. So, how to get out of difficulty loops? Well, number one, use entropy as a risk illuminator. And number two, use it as an opportunity trigger. Right? Very, very simple stuff. So then, why don't we skip around in states of joy and happiness, going transform, innovate, new beginnings, yay! Why is that not happening in this conference? People especially the dumb ones. People! Don't take it personally, Chris. So now we come to the section called suffering. Yeah? Suffering it is. These are the common question, questions I get. Why doesn't people difficulty ever end? Yeah? Why does emotion override data? Why do meetings become political? That's terrible, tragic kind of experience. And there is a simple answer, intense wanting. Intense wanting. That's the view of this Buddhist theory. So here goes Catherine trying to prove that. Hmm? So humans have reactions to entropy. It's very handy, right? Like that. Don't like that. Got my bias of what I want to do about that or how I see that. That's good information. You see a storm coming, don't like that, I'm going to do something about that and get safe. Yeah? See some kind of food, I like that, I'm going to go eat that and keep myself in a state of survival. So we want these things and emotions tell us how, the intensity tells us you know, how awful or how um, not so such a problem it is. 
Now, when we intensely want something, then the like has a bit more want inside of it, and it increases in intensity till we have this concept of more is more. You see that when people eat chocolate. More is more. Very, very highly intellectual scientists eating chocolate until they can't stop. Yeah? I know a, I know a, a scientist who ate so much chocolate with a certain type of chemical in it because it didn't have sugar that he got the runs. That's a scientist for you there. Okay. Dislike plus want. If that increases in intensity, you start saying, never, ever, never, never, I don't want that. Yeah. And if bias, if you add more energy to bias, then you start to get prejudice, right? Well, I think I want things my way. I want to work with these types of people always. I only want to work with agile and lean. Or, you know, see my view. Just know my view. Let's just make my view the view. Yeah? Okay. And then, when you add even more intensity to more is more, you start to get greed. Right, that's where you get things like addictions and obesity, power-hungry behavior. Never ever add some want. That increases the intensity and becomes hatred. And then you get a little bit of prejudice. You add a lot of want and you get deluded. The best people for the job are white, male, and stale. And that's how we got to run the world, right? A two-year-old toddler is an expert at that, that behavior, because that's what's happening. I want, and if I ramp up the intensity, I'm going to get awesome. I don't know how many parents are in the room, but I see a lot of people nodding. Yeah? Now, emotion is good, because it gives us helpful information, but the higher the emotional intensity in the room, or in yourself, the less your intellect is engaged, right? And the reason that is, is because you're internalizing about what you want and what you see. So you're closing down to go into a state of action, getting, right? Getting that to go away, getting that to, to bring it closer, or getting it the way I want. So that narrow-mindedness comes into play. So you lose context, you're not seeing everything in the room, not seeing everything that's going on, and you, don't, you think you have no choice now. You're just going to have to get. Right? And in the worst possible case, you start to disconnect from reality and data, and that's why you get these conversations where you're like, hang on a minute, I think we came in here with some data and we've just ended up with a, with a conversation about something completely different. Get, 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 get. So I call these the three saboteurs, and I use them um, in my training, and I teach people this. And basically what's happening, if I can walk around my little machine here, what's happening is that um, we have data and reality, and we have our initial reaction to that. No human being cannot have a reaction. Okay? Like, dislike, or bias will arise. That's fine. That's information. And then what happens is, if we get more intense with our emotion, and you can hear this with language inside meetings, more is more, never ever, my way or the highway, yeah? That's flicking us up to a situation where we see less context and choice, right? And then if we get into spaces of greed, hatred, and delusion, not because greed, hatred, and delusion are necessarily the thing that does it, what's happening is your intensity is making you very internalized. And then you're prone to not see very much context or choice. You're further away from data and reality. You feel less maneuverable or adaptable because you're stuck up there getting because you want, right? That's the intensity of the emotion. And if you run at that high intensity level where you think if you could do a toddler 24-7 at work, you run the risk of stress that eventually turns into fatigue and, and exhaustion, that eventually turns into burnout, and then you start losing your ability to have resilience long term, and you start losing impulse control, you start losing your temper, or you're eating crap, or you're drinking a lot. Yep. 
and you have this inability to weather difficulty to get to the other side. So even when you see something's going to be difficult, and you tell yourself, I'm going to last three months until that comes into play. You kind of don't. Right. And this is what is suffering, right? That's the difference between difficulty, hard work, and suffering. Suffering is when you are endlessly fighting entropy with a dull mind, so you're just living reactively, and how many of us are experiencing that right now, yeah? And the most severe consequence you can get from this is a fractured view of data and reality, because you're bouncing up into those red zones with lots of emotion. While you're up there, time's passing, the context has changed, a lot of data may have adjusted, and then you're slamming yourself down to try and be green and blue and see reality for a few seconds, and then you're back up again. But you're not staying with reality, you're not seeing the context constantly, you're bouncing up and down, just taking fragments of, of information and data and trying to put it together and make decisions. And that's why we get these unintended results. Unintended. People aren't necessarily evil, unintended. Misunderstandings, bad decision-making, and creating more unnecessary suffering. From the fractured pieces of information that that person has got, that difficult person thinks they're doing the right thing. Yeah? That's that bouncing up and down, right? So, time is passing, and we go up, to try and get what we want, make it very intense, and then slam down to see a little bit of reality, and up and down and up and down, and grabbing fragments of data and reality as we go, and eventually we go, I think I've got the picture. But it's all fragment fragmented bits. That's why when we look at organizations, we go, how come that is happening over there, and that is so obvious, can't they see it? There is, this is uh, why. There's people here, okay? This, this is why you have these ongoing loops of difficulty with people and emotional decisions override data and politics is always one step away in a conversation. It's to do with this intensity. Yep. It's just toddler meets toddler. So even if you're in a meeting and someone else is pushing and with their bias and their prejudice at you, and you think, you know what, I'm going to ramp up the intensity as well. And I'm going to say, no, I don't like what you're doing. You're doing it all wrong. You should be lean and agile. Both of you are toddler meets toddler. There's not going to be resolution. If you think of anybody you're upset with right now, have a think. How intense is your emotion towards them? And that tells you how little you actually see of your context and your choices. You've just closed down your choices and dulled your intellect with emotional intensity. Emotional intensity is for when we're ready to fight or we're ready to run. But it's not a contemplation mechanism. Mindfulness in its simplest form, and this is you know, not muck mindfulness, read it, look it up. Um, this is just generally the idea of being mindful is just saying, practice staying with reality, practice seeing it for what it is. Don't leave it. Don't go up into this crazy red zone, right? And work with reality. Get used to it, okay? This is why mindfulness has become an industry which I've got a lot of criticisms about, yeah? But all that we're trying to find are skills in accepting things as they are so that we can have more impulse control, be more strategic, keep our head when it's going crazy, and weather through waves of difficulty because entropy is like an ocean, waves of difficulty. Let's surf, swim, yeah? Okay, is that telling me I've got to do something? Okay, how to reduce suffering loops. Don't act like a toddler. Huh? Don't act like a toddler. Have a little, you might look nice and calm and adult, yeah, but be truthful with yourself. Look in the mirror and say, when I'm next to that person I hate, am I, have I got the same intensity as a two-year-old having a tantrum? And if you do, you're not seeing your choices. And it's seeing those choices that will help you engage your intellect and get out of the situation. Right? So it's a simple process, activate your intelligence, trigger your creative thinking, and how do we do that, says the Lean Agile community to Catherine. How? Same thing, do the opposite, right? So instead of ramping up emotion, 
even if you're doing it deliberately, I want to inspire the group, I'm going to ramp up emotion, we're going to go for it, and then we go, I don't know why we missed this thing, this piece of data, we didn't really get that, right? Cool stuff down, learn to cool stuff down. We're all not good at it because of this thing called mobile phones. Technology, we're all really crap at it. And the way that you find out how to cool things down is you go to this thing called the interweb, and there's this thing called Goggle, I think. And you type in, you type in how to cool down situations, yeah? And stuff comes up and you can explore it, it's amazing. How do I get myself calm? That's what you can put in that little line, and stuff comes up and you try it, it's amazing. Anyway, that will help you see context and choice, yeah? So, consider this two-year-old toddler, want plus intensity equals get, yeah? Now, imagine a parent who responds with high emotional intensity. What happens there? Is the parent looking out for the kid? Is the parent seeing the stuff that's going on around them? Is the parent connected to data and reality? It's two, you're 30. No, not necessarily, right? What about a parent who's cool and calm? And have a consideration. Which parent has the most regrets? Right? The person who joined in. Well, you might be two and a toddler, but I'm 30 and a toddler. Let's battle it out. Yeah? Which parent has the naughtiest child? If you've got a naughty team, a naughty division, yeah? How naughty are you inside? How intense are your emotions inside? Yeah? So that's uh, coming up to tool number three. Simply counterbalance it, right? So when people get intense, all you've got to do is get some skills around reducing tension in a room. Chill them out. Here's one. What's this? A vicious circle. Yeah? Grr. So techniques like that get people going, oh, that's such a stupid joke. But it releases tension. But, um, and being in a learning state is where you can start to say, what else is going on? Yeah, what else is going on? You want to get into the interweb and type into Goggle how to do those three things, yeah? So I use my little diagram I made because I find this super helpful, okay? I've got about five minutes or so, yeah? i got to, and then i got to, okay. Um, as I literally will look at this before I go in to work out what color people are at. And if they're up in red or orange, then before I do something, I just try and cool it all down. There's no point. Because if you force with intensity people that are already intense, you're going to get it back. Yeah? I'll give you a photo later, so I'm going to sit through. So keep your eye on intensity rising. Learn that your reaction is going to determine the outcome and become an expert in cooling things down. Experts at this are paramedics, doctors, nurses and police. How long have I actually got? One minute. Can we do five? Because I've got some, one thing to do at the end. Can we do five? Oh, thank you. And if you, don't, if you walk out, I'll completely understand. Yeah? Okay. Summary. Because I've got a summary and then I've got a little exercise I wanted to say. So, you know. Right, so two concepts, there is what happens, difficulties of life and work, and there's how we suffer it, which is the reaction, right? Life and work is difficult, give you that, but you don't have to suffer it. That intensity is sending you nuts, you don't have to suffer it. You don't have to meditate either, you just have to work out how to not join in. Your reaction really does determine the outcome, this is how you have transformative resilience. Difficulty loops are caused by entropy, as I explained. That leaves us with two tools. One is the effect, um, using it to risk mitigate and using it to embrace and transform. Yeah? Suffering loops, the people stuff, comes from intense wanting, so the intensity of wanting. And the tool we have for that is counterbalancing against intensity. So getting skills to reduce tension, get context, and get into a learning state. For yourself first, put the oxygen mark on, mask on yourself before the other toddlers, yeah? So you don't act like a toddler. Um, and of course, assess that situation before you, and during while you're in there. The trick is to do this as a habit. Make this a habitual response because entropy is continuous. Don't be doing it in one meeting going, yeah, that's it, that's me done. 
You know, this has got to be something inside of you, like parents work out that if they constantly react, react to their child, the toddler, you know, and in, with emotional intensity, you get exhausted. So they get a habit, you see them. It's like, it looks like they're resigning, but they aren't, because they've got the long-term goal in mind, right? And they kind of go, listen, John, <sighs> yeah? <laughs> Shift your focus from transform the moment, transform the team. Look at the burnout in our, uh, in our industry. And instead, develop transformative resilience, right? Ride those waves of difficulty. Don't kick and punch entropy like you're kicking and punching the ocean. Instead, learn to master that reaction, the ebb and flow of difficulty. Turn it to your advantage. OK, let's practice on, our th on the planet. Shall we? Lovely. This is the bit I wanted to do, so thank you very much for indulging me. Right, how do we get here? How do we get here in this climate crisis? or political crisis, or whatever crisis you want to talk about. Well, entropy's in play. Our planet, or our country, is uh, degrading, dysfunctioning, and expiring in a lot of different ways. Beware of the apathy that it generates when you look at it, okay? Because it might feel easier in the short term, but you know at night, sometimes you sit there and you've got a little bit of regret and guilt at the missed opportunities of where you could have done something. So there is a sting in the tail to that, I'll just ride on it and see where it goes. Assess the situation around you before you comment and act and join so you're nice and clear-headed. We have been in a place of intense wanting in the 80s and the 90s and the early thousands, more is more, never ever, prejudice, and it's gone into places of greed and hatred and delusion, yeah? And then we've had, because of that, this fractured view of reality. And we are well-meaning, but we only have little pieces all over the world that's, you know, that we understand. We're not really sure. And we've got unintended results, misunderstandings, bad decision-making, creating unnecessary suffering. Our planet is in a place of suffering. It's got stress, it's got fatigue, and it's bloody exhausted. It's beyond its capability and capacity from what we're doing to it. What would happen if we could cool the emotional intensity down of this planet, help each other see reality? Perhaps we could see choice, right? For the long haul, not just right now, get, want, get, want. What would happen if you today, every time something pissed you off about this whole process, right? You just counterbalanced against that and you thought, I'm just gonna release the tension in myself or others. I'm going to try and get context about this and I'm going to get myself into a learning state. What would happen? What could you use? What would happen if you became an adult in this toddler situation? What happens if when you're faced with all this terrible degradation, dysfunction and expiry, you instead decided to cool down and engage your intellect and your creativity? This industry is full of geniuses. I promise you. What happens if that got engaged? And what happens if you stood there and said, yep, entropy happens, yep, emotional intensity happens, but how can I help? How can I transform, innovate, and help to create new beginnings? What kind of future could we make from this moment? What kind of future could we make? You see, you've got to remember, sure, life is difficult. This situation is pretty crap, right? But you don't have to suffer it trying to get with intense want. Instead, your reaction can determine the outcome, and there's still a hell of a lot we can do. Thank you very much.